my job to give the outsider view, right? My job to say, what do I see uh, of this as somebody who stands outside? I spend a lot of my life with health policy makers, uh, a lot of my life sitting in ministerial meetings or uh, talking to people who are running healthcare systems. Um, and, and so I'm going to focus on that societal science bit. You remember we said there were two kinds of science. There's science science here and there's societal science. And it seems to me there are two aspects of the societal science you've been talking about in the last couple of days. One is this issue of behavior change, this issue of, at, at its most extreme, uh, what Ben was just talking about, how, how we actually personalize science to fit us as individuals, more conventionally maybe, how we try to get groups of individuals to change their behavior to improve the health of societies. Um, and it's clearly an enormous subject, and I, I think that last presentation is particularly fascinating because it does point to the future of behavior change. Top-down behavior change has a, 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 a pretty poor track record. It's quite difficult for us to consistently point to interventions which cause people to change their behavior. Big shifts in behavior happen, and sometimes society manages to encourage them in happening. So smoking cessation is a prime example. Uh, but it's very difficult for policymakers to say, I want people to change their behavior and then get them to do it. Uh, whereas this more modern approach of saying, there's a range of science out there that can help me meet my own goals. And my own goals may be to spend time with my grandchildren or go skiing or whatever it is. Uh, probably has a far better chance of success because you're not telling someone what to do. You're enabling them to do what they want to do. Uh, the top-down model, we, we have really good reason to think, will work better, does work better in emerging economies. And that's probably because if you remember the old Maslow hierarchy of need, I'm sure you've all seen the triangle, the Maslow hierarchy of need, uh, people in emerging economies are much closer to the bottom of that hierarchy of need. So in Switzerland, we have 40% vaccine refusal. In Africa, we have about 1%. Uh, and that's because African parents desperately want their children to have a better future than they themselves have. Uh, whereas in Europe we have enough leisure time to sit and read maniacs on Google who tell us that there's a reason not to immunize against measles. So th that, that behavior change I thought was interesting and I, I think it may be some really quite easy pickings in, in um, in less developed, in, in, in emerging economies. And then the second aspect of societal science is policy. And a lot of you talked about uh, the need for more resources, the need for <coughs> different interactions with regulators, the need for more political priority and political attention. And those really are political questions. Um, you know, there is a, a, a veneer, there's a, a thin layer of rationality that seems to apply to regulatory and, and health allocation, health resource allocation decisions, but it's a very thin layer. These are political decisions. If you look at how medicines are approved, you know that a breast cancer medicine, uh, an HIV medicine, can be approved in six months. It can be approved on very early trial data, and it can be accessible within a few months of ever going into clinical trials in the first place. A medicine for osteoporosis, a disease which affects mostly older women who tend not to be politically difficult, typically takes 10 years to come to market. There is no particular scientific rationale for that. It's a political question. And, and so when you're dealing with this complex issue, it's really important, I think, to have a narrative that inspires policymakers and allows those making resource allocation decisions to see the consensus upon which you all agree. And, and so this meeting, like all science meetings, focused on the gaps, the areas where you disagree, the areas of uncertainty. But there's this vast area where you agree that nutrition in the first year or two years of life, the first thousand days, has a lifelong impact. It's a very important and a quite subversive message. Um, 
if you think about the kind of framing of health we think about, it's this transition we talk about from infectious disease to non-communicable disease, that as people live longer, health burdens change. In fact, you're saying something quite different. You're saying these are two interlinked issues, that there's a set of interventions, a set of research that can be done, which potentially can address uh, a, a complex interaction between infectious disease and chronic disease. That, that, that's a, a very new message for most of the people thinking about health policy. Um, if you'd gone to the Davos meeting this year, the World Economic Forum, I'm almost sure you would never have heard anybody say anything like that. Um, so it, it's really important to, to get that consensus and to communicate it, I think, uh, and to lead then to this profound change in the way that planners and health professionals see things uh, and to try and encourage this uh, trend towards thinking about optimal uh, nutrition. So that, that's my outside of view. That's my uh, view from the point of view of ignorance. Let's allow two people who have a much more expert take uh, to talk now. Mark. Expert take, take yeah, I'm not sure, but... Uh, so I will focus on the uh, science for science issues and uh, leave the uh, science for society issues and uh, the challenges linked to implementation of concrete actions, so the, the easy part, to, <laughs> <laughs> to Peter. Uh, so uh, let's go back to the context of this meeting and, and the issue that we have discussed. So clearly we all agree that uh, a diet during the first year of life have deep and long-term effect on growth and metabolism, on our immune system and susceptibility to develop infections or allergies as well on, on our behavior and cognitive development. So the, in this regard, the, the objective of the meeting was to get an updated overview on this issue, get better understanding of the mechanism that underlie the links between nutrition in children and various uh, health status and uh, disease predispositions, and identify some key scientific challenge and propose new rationalized interventions. So uh, I think that in this regard, the, the meeting was a success. This is my personal feeling. I think that we clearly uh, uh, fulfill all these objectives, although naturally in a quite superficial manner because of the length, uh, time constraints. But uh, clearly we have uh, discussed actually, uh, uh, I think quite relevant issue, how to define robust biomarkers associated with micronutrient status, how to define consensual dietary reference intakes and reference values in various contexts, in particular in developing versus industrialized countries, in healthy versus diseased individuals, how to improve our understanding of the role played by our gut microbiota in these processes, how to design more relevant preclinical models and how to improve interventional studies, get more data, but not all kind of data as uh, highlighted by Ben, to tackle undernutrition or obesity. So as a non-specialist, I have noted a limited number of uh, uh, issues, key issues, and, uh, and take-home messages. The first one is uh, how can we or should we analyze separately the impact of diet on growth, immunity, and cognition? So I think that it's probably not possible, actually, to distinguish all these tightly intertwined processes, and in particular, malnutrition can impair immune system maturation, predispose to infection, which in turn will aggravate stunting and its consequences on growth and cognitive development. Reciprocally, psychological stress associated with food insecurity or serious life events can impact on feeding behavior, immune competence, and predisposition to metabolic disease. So this is my first point, and I think that Clearly here, this is the first issue. It will be very difficult to isolate, actually, the impact of diet on each of these physiological or physiopathological processes. My second point is, uh, since we still know very little about the mechanism underlying the effect of diet on child health uh, status, we are left with a small number of relevant biomarkers of micronutrient status relevant dietary data, particularly in children under five years of age, or early surrogate markers that are predictive 
of intervention efficacy. So to tackle such a complex issue, should we favor a transdisciplinary multisectorial approach or a reductionist one focusing, for instance, on the effect of deficiency in a particular uh, micronutrient uh, on part, uh, in a particular micronutrient on various physiopathological processes. So although transdisciplinary multisectorial strategies are absolutely necessary and will be further discussed by Peter, more focused trial can be very useful as long as they are hypothesis driven, well designed, in order to generate as much mechanistic information as possible irrespective of their final outcome. In this respect, we've discussed about the opportunity to focus on a single or limited number of robust biomarkers or metabolic processes and assess how and to what extent they are impacted by diet and micronutrient status. As discussed by Ben, this should be not do be done in a static, but instead in a dynamic fashion to assess system flexibility in response to particular metabolic stresses. And such studies will probably require more and more quantitative biology and systems biology and integration of big data drawn from in-depth molecular and biological profiling. So this new information should improve our understanding of underlying mechanism. It should help improve preclinical models through reverse translational approach and should improve interventional studies through a forward translational approach. So my third point regards the microbiota. So microbiota is certainly a key player linking diet and metabolism, infection and cognition, as suggested in particular by the effects of all these processes on, of antibiotic that administered during the, uh, the postnatal period. But also by quite unexpected observation described by uh, Michel uh, Nenlist, suggesting direct effects of microbiota derived product on social behavior. However, beyond the uh, uh, technological challenges linked to standardization of microbiome and metagenomic analysis, we still need to design relevant approaches and models to better assess the causal links between microbiota dysbiosis and associated physiopathology. This increased understanding will be required to design microbiota-derived diagnostics of stratification markers or microbiota-based intervention. The final point is when should we act? As mentioned by several speakers and discussed during the roundtables, the impact of many feeding interventions have been rather disappointing. Probably it was too late. So, and uh, high, highlighted by Maureen Black and many others, micronutrient deficiency and stunting during pregnancy can have irreversible effects on neural development of the fetus and infant cognitive development and overall growth after birth. Moreover, stabilization of our microbiota composition, which will strongly impact on our metabolism and maturation of our immune system, occurs during the first two years of life. Therefore, interventional studies will be probably most impactful if performed during the prenatal or early postnatal period. So I leave now, Peter, some conclusion regarding interdisciplinary. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mark. <laughs> I don't know whether this, uh, do, doing this sort of trio thing is uh, <laughs> something that's really the most optimal way of, of telling you about uh, what we think. Uh, but, you know, I, it was a, a seriously interesting conference. I think this was emphasized, I would say, by the first, for me, and the last lecture here by Ken Brown and, uh, and Ben Van Omen, going from, uh, from you know, deep to Africa to the future in the, uh, in the mobile phone. And, and then you probably see the connections between those things. Um, so I think one of the things I should do is, is thank Mark and his colleagues for organizing this conference, because they have been doing this. So thank you very much, <laughs> Mark. You, you are one of the organizers. <laughs> well, so you, you I'm one of the speakers. Right? I'm one of the speakers, yes. It's this, uh, you know, well, it also indicates uh, sort of the a period in the life of a speaker. You know, you start with the poster, then you speak, then you give a main lecture, and then you're the after dinner or the after conference uh, speaker. <laughs> and I think we all got to that, uh, to that point. Um, now, what, 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 are the, what are the key things I took away from this conference? I think the first one is, uh, is, is what an answer was given in the last lecture by Ben van Omen. I think we need to measure. Uh, we need biomarkers, and we need to follow those biomarkers over time. 
And uh, Ben, I wrote this down before I heard your <laughs> lecture, so I think we're still in full agreement on this. I think we also take this should take that to the next step. You know, in, in, in the end, in public health and in, uh, in, in many of the experiments we do and many of the measures we take, um, we, we change people's lives. We give them different things to eat. We give them different things. We should be able to follow that up. In, in pharma, uh, phase four trial is a completely accepted uh, situation. I think in food, we should do the same thing. It's follow up what we're doing. Uh, if we're uh, you know, giving people zinc, giving people iodine see, uh, somewhere, is let's, let's go back a few years later to see what really happened. Because sometimes the outcomes are different than we think they are in our, in our simplicity. Um, now, of course, that, that the, um, if you do that, then uh, you know, the other thing you should do, if you follow, if you follow up, you should be able to translate what, is, what, what you find back into basic research. I think Mark already emphasized this. I think it is the thing that um, you know, should, should happen much more. The link between what is applied and what is basic in nutrition uh, it should be there all the time because nutrition, by definition, is an applied science. So, you know, this 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 translation to the practice and from practice back to basic research uh, is another thing that uh, that we sp should spend a lot of uh, attention on. Now, I think one of the things that um, is more difficult when it comes to nutrition is um, you know we, we expect benefits. Everybody expects benefits when you give the, something. Now again, in, uh, when you take a drug, you don't always expect benefits. You know you, you take a risk. There's a whole paper with uh, side effects and other things that you're willing to undergo uh, to cure your fever or to cure your cancer. Um, and I think that one of the things that would help for the future is if uh, you know people who understand the situation like us start thinking in risk-benefit terms. You know, there is no benefit without risk. That's not the way biology works. Uh, there's always risk. If you, if you give uh, a large number of people something extra, you will save a few and hopefully you will not kill a few on the other side of the Gaussian curve. So uh, I think for, for you know, regulatory but also for public understanding, thinking in risk-benefit is, uh, is a critical issue. Um, now, and, and then of course, you know, it's also clear that we need to follow the consequences of what we do uh, at the longer term and do it at, at type of phase four. Now, uh, what should we do? Mark uh, and Mark uh, came to two things. First of all, you know, it's very clear that nutrition, uh, and that was very well said by the two previous speakers, nutrition is much more than just growth. It's just much more than just uh, helping the brain, helping the immune system. Um, it has an influence on everything we do. It has an influence on our susceptibility for everything. And I think that's a message that we should get out there everywhere. I was uh, struck tremendously by um, uh, Ken's slide where he showed how much WHO is doing on uh, infectious diseases and how little they're actually doing on nutrition. Uh, and, and the same is probably true for many other organizations. So the only way to change that is if we speak about this and, and make clear that we all think that nutrition has a much bigger role to play in people's health than, uh, than just even the topics we discussed uh, today. And then lastly, what would we, how do we need to do this? Uh, it's probably too simplistic an approach, but you know, we really should need a, a coordinated approach, a coordinated research agenda. There are good examples of this where this uh, works very well. I was involved in, in Europe, in the European technology platform Food for Life, uh, driven by uh, food industry, plus a large number of other stakeholders. They came up with a research agenda for a number of years. What is needed? to bring the competitiveness, in this case, of European industry to the next level. Uh, and that was clearly taken over by the EU uh, organizations and clearly reflected in the amount of money that went to different uh, areas in the, in, the, in the time after. Uh, we're now trying to do the same sort of thing with the European Institute of Technology for Food. And uh, hopefully uh, in this area, in the next Horizon program, we'll also see something similar. Would be possible would it be possible to do something like that worldwide? Is to get together with a group of people, a group of organizations, and say, look, this is what we see as the essential research agenda for the, for the future, to get rid of uh, some of the deficiencies that we've now been discussing for however many years, uh, and uh, do some of the other uh, things that are essential for our health in the future. 
Was this? Thank you very much. And I think Mark. Uh, yes, I, uh, before uh, leaving you, I uh, think that uh, it's important to uh, thank uh, the program committee and in particular the team of M uh, Merieux Nutri Science and Biofortis as well as uh, the Fondation Merieux for uh, being deeply involved actually in the organization of this meeting. I would like also to thank uh, the local organizer and in particular Benedict Pensier and Cindy Grasso. So, Thanks again, and uh, I think that uh, <laughs> and many thanks for all of you for the excellent discussion we had and, uh, and the quality of uh, your remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.